Uh, today, our seminar speaker for ACOM is going to be Mike Mills. Um, Mike is a member of the WACA group. He got his um, MS and PhD from CU in atmospheric science, um, studying under Susan Solomon, who was at the then NOAA Aeronauty Lab. Um, he was a research scientist at LAST for over 10 years. He's been a project scientist at NCAR for over 10 years. And uh, he is currently the Wacom Community Liaison, which means he's the keeper of all the model secrets. Um, he's done a whole lot of work on stratospheric aerosol microphysics, ozone chemistry, and their impacts on climate through volcanic and anthropogenic processes, uh, including limited nuclear war. And Mike's uh, paper from a few years ago on volcanic SO2 emissions just recently last year won the 2019 UCAR Outstanding Publication Award, um, which included a lot of researchers from a really broad swath of the community. Um, so with that, please welcome Mike Mills. Thanks, Nick. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot about modeling with some history of the impacts of volcanoes on climate to begin with. Uh, I wanted to start with this beautiful animation from a series of photos taken by an astronaut on the International Space Station of the 20, uh, 2009 eruption of Sarachev Peak in the Kuril Islands, which are uh, between Kamchatka and Japan. And um, they just happened to be going overhead when this happened. And you could see a lot of different things going on. Um, the ash cloud rising, uh, condensation forming in a bubble cloud and punching a hole in the lower deck of clouds and then pyroclastic flows going along the, the ground there. Um, and I believe this is a, an uninhabited island, fortunately. Um, a lot of the work on climate was uh, shown here was done with a, a number of collaborators that I've listed here. and. Um, I'm sure uh, a number of others that I probably left out. Um, so let's start uh, with what is known as the year without a summer. This um, happened following the eruption of Mount Tambora in the year 1815, which was the most explosive volcanic eruption to the last 10,000 years. It happened on an island um, in Indonesia where only 26 out of 12,000 people uh, survived this eruption on that island. Uh, there was an, er uh, <clears throat> an earthquake as well. Uh, a total of about 90,000 people are thought to have died. About 200 miles around the volcano experienced three days of total darkness from all the material um, that was put into the atmosphere. This is what happened uh, half a world away in Connecticut. Um, these are the mean June temperatures in Connecticut um, in the late 18th and early 19th century. And you can see this big drop here in the year 1816, which is the year following the eruption. And again, in 1817, uh, there was a book uh, that came out in 2014 about this eruption by Gillen Darcy Wood, Tambora, the eruption that changed the world. He said, for three years following Tambora's eruption, to be alive almost anywhere in the world meant to be hungry. In New England, 1816 was nicknamed Year Without a Summer or 1800 and froze to death. Germans called 1817 the Year of the Beggar. Across the globe, harvests perish in frost and drought or are washed away by flooding rains. Villagers in Vermont survived on porcupine and boiled nettles while Peasants of the Yunnan in China sucked on white clay. Summer tourists traveling in France mistook beggars crowding the roads for armies on the march. And in fact, uh, the eruption happened about the same time as the Battle of Waterloo. So uh, Europe was recovering from many years of Napoleonic Wars. And this uh, <clears throat> eruption and climatic disruption caused hardships at that time um, on top of that. Um, this is the, the snow line in June in New England. Um, you don't usually see snow in June in New England. Um, <clears throat> and it went up uh, all the way north of Massachusetts into 
main the growing season in new england was dramatically reduced in 1816 compared to years before and after um, dropping by um, more than half in some cases uh, which produced a, a <clears throat> a big uh, crunch on people's ability to feed themselves. The prices of um, these staple crops uh, increased um, and uh, coincidentally the prices of pork and beef uh, dropped as um, people were forced to slaughter livestock to avoid starvation. Um, something sadly that's going on right now with the COVID crisis. There was famine in Europe and in Bengal, India. There were riots in France. People started fleeing New England uh, following this and the moving out into the Midwest. Emigration set back Vermont's population growth by seven years and population by 8%. Uh, the migration westward um, caused the, spurred the development of the Erie Canal in 1817 to improve transportation into the interior. Um, th this is also the time of the first cholera pandemic, the first time that cholera spread outside of India. Um, and it's believed that this had to do with disruptions to the monsoon, the Asian monsoon, um, which in which uh, there were periods of of dryness that when it was normally wet, followed by periods of uh, a large amount of precipitation. And uh, here we can see the, the path of cholera from India through the Middle East into Europe and to the United States. This is a photo of Mount Pinatubo erupting in 1991. Mount Pinatubo was likely uh, the largest perturbation of volcanic uh, sulfur into the stratosphere of the 20th century. Um, this eruption shown in this picture uh, happened just a few days before the eruption that put the, the sulfur into the stratosphere. Um, the one that put it into the stratosphere happened in the middle of a typhoon, so we don't have nice pictures of this, but there were a series of eruptions leading up to that. And this is a uh, plot of temperature anomaly from the late 1800s until uh, the early 21st century. And we see um, drops following, uh, drops in temperature following uh, eruptions like Krakatau, uh, Santa Maria, Agung in 1863, um, <clears throat> El Chichon happened in 1982 and Pinatubo in 1991. So how do volcanoes cool the planet? This is an animation from the New York Times illustrating how uh, this happens. Basically, um, the volcanoes put sulfur gases into the stratosphere, which then are converted into aerosols, which are tiny and shiny particles that reflect sunlight back out into space and um, keep that energy from reaching the Earth's surface. The situation is considerably more complicated than that. Um, this is a, a slightly more complicated figure I found uh, from NCAR's Comet program um, showing that uh, the, the, the reflection of, of light from the so sun back out into space, um, scattering, but also the fact that the aerosol is absorbing the long wave radiation that the earth is emitting back out into space. So that's, um, those are the direct radiative effects of stratospheric aerosol. And in addition to that, there are also indirect effects in that the aerosols can affect clouds and they have different effects um, on, on clouds, uh, particularly, um, th these aren't, necessarily well understood because it's very difficult to study these in the real atmosphere, but um, aerosols can affect the size of cirrus clouds um, and they can also 
potentially affect uh, clouds in the lower atmosphere. <clears throat> and clouds have a big impact on the radio budget of the Earth. So we have developed uh, a capability for modeling volcanic eruptions in WACOM, the whole atmosphere community climate model. And in order to implement that, we also had to develop this uh, database of volcanic eruptions. And this is part of our database. This is the part that um, is in the, the, the period of satellite observations, which started in 1979. Um, with the, uh, the TOM satellite. Uh, and over that period, the uh, observations of sulfur dioxide from volcanoes is increasingly well characterized. And um, Anya Schmidt, who's at Cambridge University, developed this part of our volcanic database uh, to, um, to incorporate into our, our model. And here we see, um, the size of these circles represent the energy of these eruptions. So uh, these are by what's called volcanic explosivity index. And in this period, Mount Pinatubo is the only one that has a VEI of six, the most explosive. Um, the vertical axis is the latitude uh, from the equator to the North Pole and the South Pole. Um, and the horizontal axis is the year. Now, the color of the circle has to do with the mass of sulfur dioxide in teragrams of SO2. And so the, um, the ex explosivity gives some indication of how high these materials get into the atmosphere, into the stratosphere. Um, and the mass of SO2 is really crucial to the climate impact. So, for example, while Mount St. Helens had a lot of energy and a lot of ash that covered the United States, it didn't really put out a lot of sulfur the way El Chichon did a few years later, um, or, or one year later. Um, and El Chichon therefore had a more significant impact on climate of the earth. Latitude is also important where um, if an eruption puts material into the tropics, it can spread to both hemispheres, whereas if it's um, higher latitude or mid latitudes, it tends to stay in the hemisphere where the eruption occurred. Looking at this uh, record of sulfur dioxide, people have generally noted the large eruption of El Chichon in 1982 and Pinatubo in 1991 being followed by a volcanically quiescent period from 1996 to 2005. And then following that, we've had after, since 2005, um, more frequent small and moderate uh, magnitude eruptions that have put a significant amount of material into the stratosphere. Now there's another way to look at that if you're interested in knowing um, how frequent small and moderate eruptions are, uh, if we remove the, uh, the largest eruption, Pinatubo, and only look at um, magnitudes three, four, and five, we can see um, the amount of, of sulfur dioxide put in in the 1980s in, um, from these small and moderate eruptions was about 6.3 teragrams. In the 1990s, now again, remember we're removing Pinatubo, um, which is a big one. <laughs> there was only 1.4 teragrams from the smaller and moderate eruptions. And in the 2000s, there was 5.3. And then uh, from 2010 to 2015, there was 3.7. And so this period uh, when Pinatubo erupted in the 1990s uh, stands out as a period of um, very few of these small and moderate eruptions, and they seem to be um, more the norm um, than happened during, during that decade. So one of the motivations for our research is wondering what is the impact of these small and moderate eruptions after 2005 on stratospheric aerosol properties, global climate change, and stratospheric ozone recovery. Um, 
And also we want to know how frequent are small to moderate magnitude eruptions. Um, and is that period unusual? We're going to be using, as I mentioned, the WACA model, um, which is part of the Community Earth System model, CESM. Uh, WACM is the whole atmosphere community climate model. Um, and the latest version, version six, has interactive chemistry with prognostic modal stratospheric aerosols that are needed to derive these um, properties from the sulfur emissions. This shows um, the atmosphere component of CSM, um, where the standard atmosphere component is CAM, which goes up to about 45 kilometers, which is in the middle upper stratosphere. Um, the WACA model goes a lot higher to 145 kilometers, um, which is uh, above the top of the mesosphere and in the lower thermosphere, uh, we like to say it's the, the edge of space. Um, and then we have an extended version of Wacom that goes even higher. Uh, but Wacom really can um, include all of the, uh, the physics and chemistry and dynamics that interact uh, following a volcanic eruption. And so that is um, really needed for these studies. So in order to study um, the effects of volcanoes, we need to look at the chemistry because volcanoes don't put these particles in, as we mentioned directly, they put in this gas, sulfur dioxide primarily. And once this gas SO2 gets into the stratosphere, it follows these oxidation pathways to form sulfate aerosol. Um, and these are all included in the, the model's chemistry. Um, so this is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the chemi chemical oxidation pathway. And once um, you have sulfuric acid, it tends to gather around it uh, water molecules in the stratosphere to form these little droplets of aerosol. And then these droplets can grow by condensation of more of these gases. They can grow by coagulation running into each other. And once they become uh, large, they start falling through the air, um, which can uh, remove them from the stratosphere ultimately. So all of those properties are included in the model. Um, this is uh, observations of Mount Pinatubo. And in the upper left, we see uh, the period before the eruption uh, where this is what we call the non-volcanic background stratospheric aerosol. And then the eruption happened on June 15th, 1991. So in the June, July period uh, following the eruption, um, we see the initial aerosol, which is ringing the globe around the equator. The eruption Mount Pinatubo happened in the Philippines, uh, in the tropics. And then uh, because of the dynamics of the, of the stratosphere, it starts spreading uh, poleward until we have aerosol covering the globe. And then it starts being removed with both sedimentation and transport of air out of the stratosphere um, in, the, in the subsequent years. This is a Wacom uh, simulation of the Mount Pinatubo eruption uh, happening in June 1991. And here we can see it moving, as we said, around the tropics. Um, you probably can't see all the detail over the uh, internet, but um, it is subsequently moving north and south. Uh, interestingly, exactly two months after Pinatuba erupted, we had an eruption happen in Chile, Cerro Hudson, um, which also input uh, a significant amount of sulfur in the Southern hemisphere. Now, this is a series of an animation of a series of, of small and moderate eruptions since 2005 uh, clips here. Starting in 2008, we have the Kasatoshi eruption uh, happening um, in off of Alaska, followed uh, by the Sarachev peak, um, which we saw in the first slide in 2009. Um, and those are high latitude eruptions 
Um, now here in 2011, we had three eruptions happening at different latitudes um, within a month of each other. In 2014, the Kalud eruption happens in the tropics and uh, stays there for a while before spreading out. And then finally, here is the 2015 eruption of Calbuco, which happened in southern Chile and, as we'll see, contributed to a record large ozone hole that happened in 2015. So in order to, model, to validate our model, we compare um, the properties that it calculates against observations. And in this uh, plot, we see uh, solid lines showing the stratospheric budget of various sulfur gases and aerosols in Wacom um, versus time from these eruptions. Uh, from 1980 until about uh, 2015. Um, and the black line is the sulfate aerosol mass. Um, everything here is in gigagrams of sulfur. Um, and the first observation we have is from the uh, HIRS satellite of the amount of sulfate following the Pinatubo eruption in 1991, shown in purple. And the model is uh, matching the total amount of sulfur uh, that was observed following the eruption pretty well. Uh, carbonyl sulfide is a gas that supplies a fairly constant amount of sulfur to the stratosphere, um, regardless of volcanic eruptions. And uh, that's responsible for a lot of the non-volcanic background in the stratosphere. And um, the model gets about the same amount uh, that is observed from the MEPAS, MEPAS satellite shown in green here. Um, and we have some other um, observations from MEPAS, um, but uh, these are preliminary data. And I think, um, for example, the SO2 is showing signs of a detection limit in the instrument there, but we see um, the increases uh, spikes happening about the same time that, that we get in the model from these eruptions. One reason we need to use a model to simulate this interactively is due to issues of measuring sulfate in the stratosphere from satellites. And this is a, a schematic of the, um, the atmosphere from pole to pole with the equator in the middle and the black line is the tropopause bulging at the equator. Um, and uh, we have this region we call the lowermost stratosphere at mid and high latitudes, um, where satellites have uh, difficulty measuring uh, sulfate uh, in, the stratos in the lowermost stratosphere. And that's due to interference um, from, from clouds. Uh, this is primarily occultation satellites have this problem. Today we have um, more sophisticated satellites with, with LIDARs that don't necessarily have this problem, but um, those are very localized measurements. And so the global measurements we have um, have, have certain problems out, outside of the tropics measuring the region where a lot of sulfate is in the stratosphere and affecting climate. These are um, model calculations, um, and each of these little two-letter codes is a different volcanic eruption that's happened over this period. Um, and on the top is the aerosol optical depth in the stratosphere um, due to these eruptions. And we can see in around the year 2000, after uh, about nine years after the eruption of Pinatubo, the, we've settled into this non-volcanic background level um, that's fairly constant, although we also have a number of these, these small eruptions happening as well. Um, and on the bottom, we've taken the volcanic aerosol optical depth from the full depth of the atmosphere, and we do this by running two simulations, which are both nudged with the same um, observe temperatures and winds, uh, but one of them doesn't have volcanic eruptions. And so we can uh, remove the, uh, everything um, else, uh, the sulfate that's from all other sources other than volcanoes and look through the full depth of the atmosphere uh, 
and uh, see where these uh, volcanic eruptions are uh, producing significant amounts of sulfate. Um, now, the eruptions that don't get into the stratosphere tend to have a much shorter um, impact on climate because uh, the sulfate gets rained out in the troposphere, whereas uh, that's not an issue in the stratosphere. Further uh, model validation uh, comes here by looking at LIDARs around the world. And here we have two that are um, 53 and 56 north, uh, Gestacht in Germany. Uh, sorry, I think that's Gestacht or something. I can't pronounce that. I was told I was pronouncing that wrong once. But And the other one is uh, in Siberia, the Tomsk LIDAR. Um, and in, in uh, gold. Um, and black, the black line is the aerosol optical depth from uh, the WACA model. And it does a pretty good job of matching um, both the period of around Pinatubo measured in Germany and the post-2005 period measured um, in Siberia. Now, I mentioned that um, the satellites have uh, problems <coughs> in outside of the tropics, and this is reflected in the stratospheric aerosols that were prescribed in models um, prior, for example, the CMIP-5 models, um, the previous version of models um, generally rely on uh, satellite observations of, of aerosol. And these are a couple of different um, data sets, uh, climatologies that were put out there, um, the SATO in green and the other one in blue is from the CCMI uh, study. Um, and here we see um, big differences uh, with the LIDAR, in particular uh, in the post-2005 period uh, where it's missing uh, a lot of the aerosol that is evident in the LIDAR as well as in Wacom. And uh, I believe that's due to this issue of cloud interference in the lowermost stratosphere. So um, being able to do this interactively in a model um, can produce uh, much more self-consistent and reliable results. We validate the model against lighters here uh, at a, a, a span of different latitudes from 79 north um, in Scandinavia, down um, uh, through, as we've seen, uh, Siberia, Germany, uh, Tsukuba, Japan, and Mauna Loa in the tropics, and in Lauder, New Zealand in the southern hemisphere. Um, and at all these latitudes, uh, the model does uh, generally quite well in comparison to these LIDAR observations. <clears throat> uh, we have different Wacom runs in red and blue, and that just has to do with whether we tell it what the sea surface temperatures are in the red runs or whether we use a coupled ocean model in, in blue here. Now, as I mentioned, um, aerosols don't just scatter sunlight. They also absorb the infrared uh, radiation from the Earth. And that causes warming in the stratosphere in addition to cooling at the Earth's surface. And here we see observations in black uh, from radiosons showing this warming here in 19, after the 1981 eruption of Chichon, and 19, or 1982, um, and 1991 eruption of, of uh, Mount Pinatubo. And uh, the WACA model captures that very well. In addition, we note that uh, the long-term trend is cooling in the stratosphere, and this is due to greenhouse gases um, and their, their radiative cooling in the upper atmosphere. The radiative response of eruptions uh, has also been well validated in, in uh, Wacom. Um, and uh, this is uh, following the eruption of Pinatubo again in 1991. Um, on the top plot, we have the absorbed shortwave radiation, <clears throat> which is uh, decreasing um, 
and uh, the black line is obser observations uh, from the Earth radiation budget satellite. Um, and in red, we have um, uh, Wacom simulation with eruptions and blue without eruptions. And so we can see the impact um, that had on the shortwave radiation due to the scattering from volcanic aerosols. Um, and the middle is the outgoing long wave. This is the absorption of the infrared light um, showing uh, a good correspondence to observations as well. And the bottom is the difference between the two, the net effect on the Earth's radiation budget. So what is the impact of small to moderate eruptions on surface climate? This is a, a figure from a paper that was in Nature in 2016 um, showing the global ocean heat content in uh, model simulations uh, for uh, CMIP-5. And we note uh, not only that uh, we have a lot of warming in the oceans due to the uh, carbon dioxide increasing over time, but also these periodic uh, big drops following these volcanic eruptions. And um, this is Mount Agung in 1963 El Chichon in 82, uh, Pinatubo in 91. And these can uh, set back um, the rate of global warming uh, for a decade or so um, in the oceans because of the, uh, the long inertia of the oceans. So um, we wanted to diagnose in the model um, what was the impact of, of these uh, recent eruptions. And um, here we're looking at uh, the long wave radiation in red, the short wave in blue uh, changes due to volcanic eruptions and uh, the net effect uh, of the two in black. And in order to do this, we had to again run Wacom simulations with and without volcanoes, uh, which were both nudged with the same winds and temperatures. And again, we note uh, El Chichon and Pinatubo causing their impacts, followed by uh, this quiescent period and the small magnitude eruptions. Um, and we're able to uh, diagnose uh, the forcing um, in this period, uh, particularly the, the quiescent period from 1999 to 2002 Stratospheric aerosol during this period when there were few eruptions had um, an effect of negative 0.04 watts per square meter. Whereas the period from 2005 to 2015 had a uh, forcing of negative 0.12 watts per square meter. So the difference between um, those two periods, the effect of volcanoes on those two periods is negative 0.08. Over the same period, uh, carbon dioxide forcing caused a rated a positive rated of forcing of 0.25 watts per square meter. So the volcanic eruptions offset about 30% of the warming over that period. And the numbers we get here are consistent with uh, previous studies from IPCC and uh, Susan Solomon, 2011. So these, these uh, eruptions are important and they should not be neglected in uh, climate prediction. This is uh, something we did using um, an energy budget model um, and looking at surface temperature anomalies where the, the gray um, shaded area is observations with uh, ENSO effects on global climate removed. Um, and this green line is um, using the forcing from the, the climatology we showed before from Sato et al, um, which neglected uh, a lot of these more recent eruptions. And um, we see uh, um, more warming in the green line than was observed, but um, more recently, um, these are two different Schmitts, by the way. Gavin Schmidt uh, did a paper uh, 
showing uh, calculations in this blue line, which he updated the SATO 14 to include these small and moderate eruptions and got something much closer to the observations. And this is com uh, consistent with what Anya Schmidt and I did um, using Wacom in 2018, in which we have these small and moderate eruptions in there. Um, and so we get um, the fact that the after 2005, the, the cooling, the difference between these lines is uh, about 0 0.07 degrees. Now, volcanoes also affect the ozone loss and recovery. Um, as many of you know, ozone is what defines the stratosphere. The ozone layer causes temperatures to increase as you go up in altitude in the stratosphere, whereas in the troposphere and the mesosphere, you get temperatures going down as you go up. Um, the ozone hole, shown here as the level of total column ozone um, over Antarctica in October was a big surprise. Um, although ozone loss had been predicted, nobody expected before it was discovered that there would be this dramatic more than 50% loss in the total column of ozone happening over Antarctica at a particular season every year from September to January. Um, and observations are shown as these white dots and model in red with projections into the future that uh, we should have a recovery to about 1980 levels by somewhere around the year 2060 due to international agreements uh, banning the chemicals that were causing this to happen. So the recipe for an ozone hole is you have to have chlorofluorocarbons or halogens in the stratosphere. You have to have cold temperatures, um, which create these clouds of ice in the stratosphere, polar stratosphere clouds. They're very, very beautiful, also known as mother of pearl clouds. And finally, you have to have sunlight. That's why this happens in the springtime over Antarctica and not in the winter. Uh, this is from a paper um, Bob Portman, Susan Solomon, and co-authors did in 1996, um, looking at observations and model calculations of the October ozone over Antarctica, uh, 75 degrees south, um, during this period when chlorine in the stratosphere is rising, as you see on the bottom, and the observed aerosol is episodic with various eruptions, Chichon and Pinatubo shown here. And um, in the model calculations, we have two different model runs. Uh, the solid line is with the observed aerosol and the dashed line is with constant sort of non-volcanic levels of aerosol. And you note these dramatic uh, drops following the eruptions of El Chichon and Pinatubo which generally follow the observations. Whereas the model with constant aerosol um, doesn't show the same fluctuations there. So this is uh, very similar to what we get in the latest Wacom simulations. Um, and uh, this is the, the Antarctic region from 60 south to 90 south. Um, observations from satellites are shown in black and various Wacom simulations are the different colors here, whereas where the purple um, dots and lines are the SD Wacom specified dynamics where we nudge the winds and temperatures to match what were observed. And that's crucial to getting the right setup for the ozone hole. And when we do that um, and include the emissions from volcanic eruptions, we get a very good uh, agreement with those observations over time of the total column ozone over Antarctica. This is a, a figure from um, a paper led by Susan Solomon on the emergence of healing uh, in the Antarctic ozone hole. Um, and it shows 
the impact of volcanoes on the ozone hole um, over time from 1999 to 2016. And here you can see um, some, uh, some important uh, eruptions that impacted the ozone layer. Uh, this one PC is the uh, Pujewe Cordoncaue in Chile. Um, and this one in 2015 is Calbuco, also in Chile. So these eruptions that happen close to Antarctica in Chile and put a significant amount of sulfur in had a big effect on decreasing the ozone hole in uh, the year that followed. And in fact, um, this is an, another paper led by Diane Ivey using Wacom uh, that showed the, uh, the impact of this Calbuco eruption in 2015 on the record large ozone hole that happened that year. Um, here we see uh, versus the day of the year, the size of the ozone hole in millions of square kilometers. The gray is the historical uh, size of the ozone hole since it first formed over, uh, so these are many years. Um, the uh, teal blue green here is the TOMS observations of the size of the ozone hole. And, then, and the orange is SD Wacom calculations, including volcanoes. When we remove the volcanoes from our simulation in the yellow line, uh, we get a significantly smaller ozone hole there. Um, and so it reduces the size of the ozone hole um, so that it, it doesn't really reach a record uh, large size for a significant period of time. Um, now in those uh, simulations on the left, we're nudging the, the winds and temperatures to be what were observed. Uh, but those, those winds and temperatures are also affected by the uh, volcanoes. And so um, we did other simulations um, with free running uh, Wacom, which we didn't nudge the temperatures. Uh, of course, in that case, you're not going to get as good correspondence to the observations, but you can compare the runs with and without uh, volcanoes. And we see that um, the, the, the free running, um, the free running simulations actually produce a larger ozone hole than the nudged um, ones do. And that has to do with uh, a, a larger difference between the, the, the runs with and without volcanoes. And that has to do with the, uh, the fact that the, um, the interaction of the volcanoes with the ozone produces a, a cooling. Uh, when you have less ozone, you have less heating of the stratosphere. And, and so you have a feedback effect in which uh, you um, create a colder uh, polar vortex in Antarctica because you have a lot of ozone loss. And that produces more ozone loss. Um, this uh, affects of volcanoes uh, doesn't just happen on the ozone layer in Antarctica, but also globally. And here um, are again uh, observations in black and Wacom nudge simulations in purple matching very well. And again, we see the effects of Chichon and Pinatubo, which reduced the global amount of ozone by about three to five percent each. Um, and we also are showing here um, uh, model Wacom runs that were not nudged. Uh, we have a lot less ozone here and that has to do with our circulation in the model being a bit too fast. So this has led a lot of people to the idea that if uh, volcanoes can offset global warming, why don't we offset global warming by creating something like a volcano? Uh, the idea of geoengineering um, or climate engineering, spraying particles, it could be the same ones that the volcanoes do into the atmosphere or something perhaps better. So we started using the WACA model for uh, looking at the effects of doing something like that. And the motivation has to do with 
the fact that global warming is accelerating. Billions of people are already suffering its effects. Dramatic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are the only way to stop it. And under the most optimistic of scenarios, significant future suffering is still inevitable. So this raises the question of whether we should try to reduce suffering by interfering more with the climate. Um, and if we do try to do that, can we hope to control uh, what we're doing in a complex Earth system? Our simulations have relied on the concept of feedback, where we don't just do something in the model and um, ignore what it does and, and run an experiment for the full period, but we make an adjustment, look at what it does, and use that knowledge to, um, to feedback on what we do in the future. Uh, feedback is something that we use whenever we uh, get into a shower in a hotel room that we're not familiar with um, and we don't know how sensitive the, the <clears throat> temperature dial is. So we set it to one position, measure it and make adjustments from there. So our modeling approach uh, varies the emission of sulfur dioxide gas from year to year at four different latitudes to control three climate parameters using feedback. The three parameters are the global average temperature, the equator to pole temperature gradient, and the interhemispheric temperature gradient, the difference between the, the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere. And so we were able to run um, what we call a, a large ensemble of simulations from the year 2020 to 2100. And, um, using feedback control those three parameters. Um, so this is under a scenario which, with uh, global warming uh, that is business as usual, out of control, RCP 8.5, um, nobody's really controlling carbon emissions. Um, and we're trying to um, offset the full effect of that on those three different um, parameters and largely are able to do that, although by the end of this century, we are putting in a huge amount of sulfur into the, into the stratosphere to do that. And so to do that, um, this is an animation showing how this works. This is stratospheric sulfate in the year before we start geoengineering. We're looking here at uh, the non-volcanic background and the model is noting um, where the temperature is, is warming and starting to do some injections in the Northern hemisphere in the first year to offset warming there. And then in the second year, it starts putting some into the Southern hemisphere. And this, we have again at, at four different latitudes, this continues um, until we have an aerosol clevered uh, planet here, reflecting sunlight back into space. Um, this is uh, another way of looking at the simulation, uh, looking at the effects on, on temperatures. Um, and uh, here uh, we're gonna see effects on these maps. On the left, we're starting a simulation in RCP 4.5 in the 1990s and in the year 2020, which is coming up here, we start doing our feedback simulation. So the, the right one starts moving and we can compare the global warming and the globe on the left to the geoengineered world on the right. Um, and these are temperature um, anomalies compared to the year 2020. And if you put enough sulfur in there, you're able to offset quite a bit of, of global warming, according to the model, if the model is correct. Um, but all of this sulfate, as we noted, has impacts on the ozone layer and particularly the Antarctic ozone hole. So uh, here, we look at the um, 
the total amount of SO2 increasing from 2020 to 2100 in the upper left. Um, and in the lower left, we look at the October total column ozone um, as the ozone hole is recovering in the 21st century uh, due to the Montreal Protocol and amendments uh, in the black curve. If we add geoengineering to that, the blue, it sets back the recovery of the ozone hole by um, a couple of decades at least. Um, however, if we look at other regions of the globe, um, in the upper right, we have the Arctic ozone dent, which is a much smaller version of the ozone hole. On the other side of the globe, uh, the impacts are not quite as big. Um, and globally, um, here in the lower right is the effect on uh, mid-latitude ozone, 40 to 60 north, um, with geoengineering not really being significant at all. Other things uh, we've looked at are the impacts of uh, geoengineering on um, temperature and precipitation. Um, <clears throat> And uh, all of these have led to a, a large number of publications and all this data is available at this, uh, this website shown here below. Um, so I just thought I'd introduce people who aren't familiar with this work to, uh, to what we've done in that space. And then um, I just have conclusions here, a summary that uh, aerosol climate models now rely on volcanic sulfur dioxide emission estimates and other source term parameters rather than prescribing stratospheric aerosol. Uh, the Wacom model, stratospheric sulfur budgets and stratospheric aerosol properties and radiative responses are well validated in the satellite era from 1979 onwards. Small to ma uh, moderate magnitude eruptions do matter. Um, Volcanically quiescent periods are statistically, they seem to be statistically rarer than periods of uh, small, uh, frequent small to moderate magnitude eruptions. Um, and the eruptions that happen after 2005 offset about 30% of the warming from CO2 emissions uh, since the uh, period right before 2000. Eruptions also affect the recovery of polar ozone. And finally, Wacom uh, is starting, to, it, it has been used for geoengineering studies with uh, these sulfur injections. Thank you, and I'll take uh, questions now. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, so given the number of uh, people here, if you have uh, you know, a question and then a follow-up, you can feel free to ask your question. Um, if you have multiple questions, I just ask you to use your best judgment and let other people ask them. Finally, um, if you have a question and you really want to uh, get it answered, you can enter it into the chat and I will uh, make sure that uh, it gets addressed. Um, so with that, anyone have any questions? Hi, I'll ask a question. Uh, this is Margo speaking. Hi, Mike. Um, I was wondering uh, if you did, were to change the altitude of your injections, could you get rid of the problem of depleting the ozone hole if you inject high enough? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, the, well, yeah, because of the way that the uh, air moves in the polar vortex, it uh, descends in there um, and into the region where where ozone loss is largest in the lower stratosphere. So um, sulfate is going to get in there. Um, for for practical purposes, for geoengineering, it it's generally more difficult and more expensive to put sulfur up higher it takes more more energy um and um i don't think that would uh it, that, that would have other advantages though it would uh, it would last longer in the atmosphere and you uh, 
might be able to, might be um, able to put, put, less of it put less of it in, which, which would, have would have a reduced, reduced impact reduced on, the on the ozone. Um, so Frank has a question. Uh, how would injection of 20 to 50 megatons a year of SO2 work logistically, um, which I was also interested in. <laughs> um, there are people who are, are working on that. Um, I'm not one of those people, but I've, I've seen um, some talks on that. Um, and I think the, um, the, the best option um, is not rockets, but uh, airplanes is, is generally agreed. And, um, it seems like um, it would require the development of new aircraft technology that could loft um, uh, heavy loads up into the stratosphere um, on a regular basis, and uh, um, <clears throat> it would it would require a, a fairly constant um, fleet of of aircraft um, doing that uh, repeatedly all the time. <clears throat> Um, there, there, um, people have proposed, um, constructing some sort of a hose to do this, um, but that has, um, really big technical challenges. I think, um, you could also use carbonyl sulfide, which is a, a, a gas, um, that produces the non-volcanic background. However, um, first of all, a lot of that would be consumed at the surface by plants who prefer to consume OCS to CO2. Um, and if you're producing a huge amount of it in one spot, it, it can be toxic. So it seems like um, some sort of aircraft is, is the way people think this might be done. Okay, so there's another uh, question in the, the chat window by Haiyan Tang. Um, given the large internal variability of the climate system, how should we verify whether models can simulate the right climate response to small volcanic eruptions? Yeah, that's, that's really a good question. Um, it's even difficult to do for large eruptions like Pinatubo, uh, frankly, because um, there is a huge amount of variability just due to things like um, ENSO and so forth. And so we've been able to validate um, the radiative response in nudge simulations, uh, in which we nudge the temperatures and winds and just look at the impacts on the short wave and long wave radiation as I show. Um, and that is easiest to do for these large eruptions like Pinatubo where you have a, a large signal. Um, for the small and moderate eruptions, um, there's a much smaller signal and in, we're getting down to uh, detection limits of, of satellites. But um, the, the best that we've been able to do for those is to look at uh, aerosol properties as measured from, um, from LIDARs and then to um, ensure or, or assume that our model is behaving well um, under, under small burdens the way it is under large burdens. And that involves getting the, uh, the microphysics and the, the scattering correct in our models. So um, to some extent, it, it's difficult to to do exactly what you you asked to do uh, for small and moderate eruptions, but we we do it indirectly. Um, another comment: What would be the uh, visible optical depth? of the sulfate particles for, say, the middle of the century? 
we have uh, simulations uh, from CMIP, uh, CMIP 6 uh, from the period from 1850 to present. Um, and um, generally, volcanoes produce the biggest uh, changes in the optical depth in the stratosphere. Um, the non-volcanic background is fairly constant, but that said, um, in our now, obviously, we don't know uh, a lot about this from observations, but we have our model simulations, and there is a trend of increasing um, background non-volcanic sulfate in the stratosphere, and that is because of a trend in carbonyl sulfide source gas, um, and we know about that um, from ice core uh, observations um, and um, it's a, um, there's a, there's a paper by Steve Monska, uh, showing the, uh, the, the change of that since, um, uh, the 1700s until the present. Um, and in the, in the, uh, latter half of the 20th century, there is a big increase in OCS, but, um, compared to volcanoes, it's still, um, relatively small, uh, source there. So there hasn't been a lot of a change in, in stratospheric aerosol over time. Okay, I've got, there's another um, question in the chat. We can, we can keep going for a little bit because we started a bit late. Um, if you need to leave, feel free to, to leave. But uh, how do um, the volcanic aerosols impact the stratus, or the, sorry, the mesosphere? Yeah, well, primarily um, their impact is going to be due to changing the temperature structure of the atmosphere. And uh, so a lot of that has to do with the, the heating that we saw um, following big eruptions like Pinatubo, which would cause an expansion of the stratosphere um, and uh, push up everything above it. But in addition to that, um, the volcanic aerosols actually physically get into the mesosphere but in a different form once once they get to the upper stratosphere the temperatures there are warm enough that they evaporate and so they go back into the the sulfuric acid gas form and also the sulfuric acid gas uh, photolyzes a bit um, from visible light and so it can form so2 gas up there um, and it is possible that uh, this does have some impact um, all the way at the, the summer mesopause where polar mesospheric clouds occur, but um, uh, that's pretty much the edge of space. So it's, it's difficult to um, detect things up there. Okay, Mike, one more um, question, which is a follow-up to the visible optical depth of sulfate. Um, oh, it was intended yeah. to be about geoengineering, the geoengineering. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Mid, that century, uh, mid 21st century, not mid 20th century. Um, uh, what is the optical depth? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I show that on, um, on these slides. Uh, I guess yeah we don't I don't have that here on these slides so I don't um, know th know that offhand I have to look that up that's that's a good question okay well if there's um if there's no more questions um, Let's thank Mike again and, and thank you all for, uh, for attending and um, we'll see you at the next seminar. Thank you.